Welcome to NCC Live. Would you get on your feet? Would you lift your hearts and your voices to God as we worship our unstoppable God? feeling lost. And Lord, we just lift our voices to you now. We cry out to you. We know that you can heal all things and make things right. So we give it to you at this time. And we know nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Hello, Northwest Christian Church. I just want to welcome you to NCC Live. And it's been great to worship with you online. If you are watching this with the ability to comment, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, let us know where you are and where you're watching from and how you are doing. And we know there's so much going on in our life, but we are so grateful to worship an unstoppable God. No challenge is too big for our God. And before we get to the message from Pastor David, in which we will continue our series called Can We Talk? We would love to get to know you and connect with you. You can fill out a connect card and you can do that from our website, mynw.cc. You can also jump on the chat, talk to some of our online hosts. They would love to help you out and get to know you. And of course, if there's something 
we can be praying for, please don't hesitate to let us know that how we can be lifting you up and encouraging you. And right now, I know there are people that could really use some help. If that's you, or if that's someone you know, please let us know what we can do to make your life a little easier. Now later in the service, we're gonna have a time of communion and a time of generosity. If you would like to financially help us continue to meet the needs of the community and connect people to Jesus, simply go to our website, click on that link that says give. All right, before we get to the message, let's jump back in with the band and lift up Jesus because no matter what, he will never let you down and he will always remain faithful every step of the way. Would you join us again as we enter into worship? Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me. I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Sing Jesus Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your Sing your praise again. Oh, oh, your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me. stand with me and sing these words as we remember that our God is greater than our circumstances and because of that it can be well within our souls so sing with me this song
grander earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice And seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard Well, it is well. 
there's an old joke that goes, I'm awesome and perfect. I only have four flaws. One, I like humility. B, I'm inconsistent. And finally, I can't count. Now, I don't know if you're inconsistent or if you can count or not count. But today's question is how are you doing with humility? We're living in a very highly contentious time. People are spewing much contempt and smugness. The serious question that we're dealing with these four weeks, can we talk? Because we are in this age of outrage. And it seems like we yell and scream or worse. Hate has risen now to new levels. Currently, it seems like most people believe about three things. One is that my political, my COVID, race opinions, in fact, all my opinions are based on good intentions and I'm a loving person. Number two, my opinions are logical, proven, factual, clear, and obvious. And finally, number three, anyone who disagrees with me is not only wrong, they're stupid. It seems like most people think these three things. And so we decided as a church that we need to talk about how important it is to talk, how important it is to separate the church and hate. We recognize how important it is to commit ourselves to postures and practices that line up with the way of Jesus because we call ourselves Christ followers. And also because far too often Christ followers, they're sucked also into this age of outrage and that damages our souls. It's also bad for our country. And sadly, it's ruining our witness for Jesus. So it's important that we get these postures, these practices right. Civility, dignity, humility, and unity. So today it's the posture and the practice of humility. While one of the most important, it may be also be one of the most difficult. But it is one of the truest indicators of how much Jesus is shaping our life. How we respond to people who disagree with us is important. How we think about people that we think just don't get it. How we act toward other people when thinking, how can they be so ignorant? So it's vitally important for the human race, but especially for those of us who call ourselves Christ followers, who follow Jesus and his way of life. Now, if anyone has the right to roll their eyes and say, unbelievable, these guys just don't get it. If anyone has the ability to say, I'm right, you're wrong. If anyone has the ability to power up and to say, hey, get in line with my way or it's the highway, the highway to hell. It has to be Jesus. Jesus can say all these things. And yet as we look at Jesus' life, his ministry, what do we find? We find an amazing demonstration of humility. So he's our example. Peter, he says in chapter two, he says that God called you and I to do good, even if it means suffering sometimes. And you go, well, why? Well, he says, because Christ suffered for you. And then Peter then says, he's leaving for you an example that you should follow in his steps. Uh, this is what we who follow Christ, this is what we signed up for. We follow his steps, meaning we demonstrate humility. So what do the steps of Jesus look like? And we have hundreds and hundreds of examples, but I want to pick a few and then I'm going to circle back to some of them. Philippians 2 reminds us how Jesus lowers himself from the glories of heaven itself and his relationship with the Father. And Jesus puts aside his rights, his power, his privileges. Again, he leaves heaven itself. He becomes human. Why? To suffer to sacrificially die, because that's what love does. He's not always about moving up in the world's terms. It's not about holding his position. He lets all of that go. And oh, by the way, you and I must follow his steps. John 13, Jesus, he shows up and we see him sitting down to eat what we now call the Last Supper. He does that with his friends. He knows they all will hurt him. They're going to abandon him. They're going to betray him. They say they're on his side, but they run away at his hour of greatest need. Knowing this, knowing all of this, the creator of the universe, Jesus, he bends down and he picks up a servant's towel. 
then he washes dirty fishermen's feet. Why? Because Jesus, well, Jesus is more concerned about God's mission than he is about holding on to his own hurt feelings. And Jesus loves undeserving friends who actually hurt him. And oh, by the way, we're to follow his steps. And then what about Mark 10? Here, Jesus and the disciples, they get into a shouting match. Not with each other, but the disciples with each other. And the disciples are shouting about who's right. They're shouting about who's most important. They're trying to win an argument. And then Jesus comes in in the middle of this heated moment. No, no, no. Guys, I expect this behavior from political leaders or from religious leaders who don't know God. I expect this kind of behavior. But not you. You're supposed to be different. If you want to be great, you want first place, then serve everyone else. Jesus goes on. Even I, the Son of Man, didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So you want to follow in the steps of Jesus? This is the call. Serve. Serve one another. Now, we can say all kinds of things about Jesus' humility, but let's pause and focus on humility for just a bit. Because humility is so often misunderstood. It really does get a bad rap. A lot of people, they mistake humility for a form of weakness. Many think it means that you're going to be a doormat, that you're going to let people walk all over you. That's not humility. Humility is much more difficult. For the Christ follower, humility comes out of a place of being so filled up with Jesus, so assured of who we are in him, that our identity is solid. And so we're not desperately trying to prove ourselves to others all the time. Living with humility, it means you don't have to defend yourself so anxiously. You don't get offended easily because, again, you know who you are in Christ. This, this gives you strength. And out of this strength, you enter calmly, confidently, courageously into discussion, even debate, without having to pull an Alexander Hamilton and get into a duel. Humility says, I don't have to because I know who I am in Christ. Remember Jesus? He lives in an age of outrage as well. And Jesus knew who he was though. And that allows him to enter into disagreements, even hostility. And he still shows humility. The question is, can you? When everything is hostile, can you still be humble? Our identity as a Christ follower is that means that it should flow into how we live. Followers of Jesus, we need to have a gut check. Are we following his ways? Are we following his steps? Are we living according to the will of the Spirit? Are we obedient to God's word? Let's be honest. When we talk about humility, there's not a lot of humility going on around these days. Be honest about your humility or your lack of it. Often we struggle because we have these reasons for arriving at our opinions and our positions that we hold, right? I mean, that's what we think. That's how we rationalize it. Now, being humble does not mean that you have to abandon all your positions. It does mean that you hold loosely, though, granting the possibility that others might also have some good reasons for landing where they land. This is humility. Without humility, you simply can't ever imagine anyone's perspective but your own. And sadly, this is how so many people go through the world. And when we say things like, it is so obvious, how can anyone not see this? That is a lack of humil humility. Humility is also connected to wisdom. When you and I insist or demand that others view the world as we do, it shows we don't know as much about the world as we think we do. When you insist that your way is the only way forward, when we're unswervingly convinced that if everyone will just come to my point of view, the world will be so much better instead of the screwed up mess it is now. Now, we may be right, but that kind of attitude conveys a lack of humility a lack of humility in the way that we communicate it. 
when we emphatically declare, how in the world can you hold that position? How can you think about voting for that candidate or that issue or whatever it is? And then you add, and you call yourself a Christian? I'm just saying that's problematic. Now listen, with all due respect, I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings or stir anything up here because I totally understand those statements because I've thought them. I've actually said them myself. But as Christ followers, even though we have some super strong convictions on important issues, if you really stop and think about it, as convicted as you may be about any of this stuff, friends, honestly, we have to humble ourselves and recognize it's arrogant and ignorant for us to make these kind of proclamations. Humility is the gift. The gift that comes along and says, I don't presume to be the smartest person in every room. I'm not the arbiter of all truth and justice in the world. I don't presume that I have a corner on intelligence. So if you have any questions about anything, you just ask me because I'm the fountain of all wisdom and knowledge. No, instead, I can be humble enough to recognize that everyone comes to their perspectives, their opinions, their ideas, their stances on politics and other things as a result of complex array of their personal background, their personal experiences and influences that they've had their whole life. Same as I, same as you. Things like whether you grew up in the city or the country, your race, your ethnicity, how much money your parents made, whether you had a good or you had a bad childhood, or a thousand other things that shape the way that you think and feel about so many things you hold today. And guess what? Everyone else is also a result of theirs. So the ability to remember this, the ability to appreciate the fact that people usually have some reasons, solid reasons, even though you may disagree with them or they're different than yours, they have reasons for landing where they do. It reminds all of us that we're finite human beings. So this is what humility says. There's nothing beneath me. Humility also says, there's no one beneath me. And my prayer today, as we see what God wants to do in our souls, is that this declaration will begin to ring true for each one of us. That there is nothing, that there is no one beneath me. Well, let's go back to Philippians 2. Paul has some very key words on humility. So in chapter 2, I'm going to pick it up in verse 1. We'll go all the way through verse 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. How? By being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit and one of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those are some powerful words. There's something so beautiful about humility. I think most of us admire humility when we see it in others. When we see true humility, I believe that's what we desire for ourselves. But again, let's admit the road to humility, it's challenging. It's a virtue never gained by merely seeking it. And just when we think we have it, it means we don't. It's funny 
how you can say certain things about yourself and people applaud you, right? Or they encourage you. You say something like, man, I'm feeling more loving these days. Oh, that's awesome. Good for you. I'm really feeling more generous these days. Hey, way to go. I'm feeling more forgiving. Wow, God's working in you. But then you tell someone, you know what? I'm feeling really humble these days. Hmm, <laughs> not sure you are. No, seriously. Humility is just flowing through, through me. I've never felt so humble before. And you go, really? Because again, the moment you think you're humble is the moment that pride comes in. This really is the paradox of humility. When we think we have it, we actually lose it. So Paul, he writes to the church because he hears about some division. I know some of you are going, really? Seriously? I mean, disunity in the church? Well, yes. Disunity not only threatens our culture, but the church as well. We're going to look at unity closer next week, but we know it's an issue. Why? Because unity comes up six times in the first two verses. United with Christ, sharing in the Spirit, being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, being of one mind. No matter how well we think we're doing as a church or even as individuals, we're always on the brink of disunity rearing its ugly head. Especially, especially if we allow the talk and the tone of the world around us to insert itself into the middle of us. Please, please know that when Paul talks about unity, he's not talking about uniformity. To be united doesn't mean that we're going to see everything the same. To be united doesn't mean that we agree on everything. It doesn't mean we vote the same way on the same issues. To be united does not mean that we all have the same opinion about issues. Now we can, but not always. And we know this is true because we see Christ followers disagree with each other throughout the New Testament. And yet Paul is crystal clear. Unity is possible and it is a worthy goal. And he tells us the way that we preserve unity. It's verse 5. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. We're united by keeping our hearts and our minds on Jesus Ask him to shape us, to shape our lives with his humble love. Paul, he summarized the issue with two phrases. He goes, selfish ambition and vain conceit. These words are traps for us as well. Selfish ambition and vain conceit says, you know what? I see the world by me being at the center of it. I'm at the center of the world. That's what I see it as. That's how I relate to the world. The world's actually a movie, and I'm really the star. I'm the center of the world, and everyone revolves around me. You guys, you're actually just supporting actors in the story of David. Uh, you might not have known that, right? Now, why don't you think like I think? Why don't you believe like I believe? That's selfish ambition. Everything centers around me and my interest. And this happens in big ways, but also in small ways. For example, ever take a group photo? And the first time that you see that picture, where do you look? Exactly. You look for yourself. And if you look good in the picture, do you like the picture? Of course. Thumbs up. Now, if everyone else looks terrible, their eyes are closed, right? But you look good. Do you like the picture? Of course. Of course you do. And you say, hey, let's frame this one. That's just a really innocent way of showing vain conceit. Because everyone revolves around us. Well, in verse 3 and 4, Paul goes, rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but actually to each of you, to the interest of others. That's what he says. Understand, this again does not mean your interests don't count. This does not mean that your goals and dreams for life are not important. This does not mean that you shouldn't have ambition. Remember, Paul, he's writing this to a faith community, a church in Philippi. Paul's saying, hey, if we live this way, if we live when we're valuing others, valuing their interest above self, if you're part of a family, you're part of a church, part of a marriage, part of a network of friendship and relationship that leads with humility, you know what the byproduct is? Your interests will be met. And just so they get it, Paul drops a bombshell about Jesus, about what God's like. This section of scripture is often known as the 
a Christ hymn. Some scholars believe that these words were already a part of the church. They've already been singing and reciting these words. This is the amazing grace of the early church. Look at verse 6. Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, again, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. And the shocker, the shocker of Christianity is that God, he reveals himself as a servant. The very essence of God is to serve. Now it gets better. This reveals another layer of God. Linguists, they tell us the word being can be translated two ways. The first is the word although. Although he is God, he became a servant. So it's a contrast Despite the fact that he's God, he decides to become a servant. Although he is this, he became that. Now the second way that it can be translated is the word because. And this makes a huge difference. Because he is God, he became a servant. This is amazing. Some would even say scandalous. Because he's God, right? Humility is the expression of of divinity. To be humble is to somehow participate in the life of God. So Jesus redefines our image of God. And then we go to John 13 and we see this evident there. We mentioned this passage earlier. Jesus, his disciples are around the table. No one's washed anyone's feet. That's the custom of the day, right? For the servant to wash dirty feet before dinner. No one, no one steps up. They wait for someone else to do the right thing. So what's Jesus do? Well, he doesn't stand up and say, I'm now going to demonstrate humility for all of you. No. He gets up. He grabs a basin. He picks up a towel. And one by one, he washes their feet. All their feet. It always amazes me. But this means Judas' feet. This means his betrayer. He doesn't skip anyone. You or I should say, I, all right, I'd be more selective not to wash Judas' feet. Or if I'm going to wash them, I'm putting them in scalding water. All right, I'm just saying. But Jesus' nature washes everyone's feet. Saint, sinner, righteous, unrighteous, holy, unholy. This is, this is why Jesus is so unique. He washes everyone's feet. The kicker, he invites us to be the same kind of servant. Now, when the towel is introduced here, it reminds me of a couple things. That there are actually two types of towels. The first towel is the decorative one, right? It's pretty. It looks like a towel, but it doesn't function as a towel. How do I know that? Well, my wife, Julie, she tells me not to use the decorative towel. And I go, what do you mean? It looks like a towel. It hangs like a towel. David, don't use, like, don't use that towel. Now, there's another kind of towel, Right? The one in the bottom drawer or it's in the trunk of your car. The one in your garage. Not very attractive, but necessary. Dirty, used, essential. Not a towel in appearance only. So I guess here's the question. What kind of towel am I? What kind of towel are you? A towel that just looks like a humble servant or one that demonstrates humility? Humility, it says nothing. No one is beneath me. Measure your humility by identifying the tasks that you think are beneath you. For me, this is a great spiritual formation question. What tasks do you believe are beneath you? Now, to be transparent, it's an ongoing struggle that I have. It's easy for me to see things that I think are beneath me. But I want you to know this is also a who. Who are the people you believe are beneath you? You probably wouldn't say it out loud, but that's how sometimes you live your life. It's how I live my life. Humility, again, says that the young person, he's not beneath me. That older person, she's not beneath me. I, I want you to know that Latino, that Anglo, that Muslim is not beneath me. That atheist, they're not beneath me. All right? Jesus washes all of our feet. He invites you and he invites me to live in the same way. Humility, no person beneath me. No task beneath me. Grab a towel. How different would our world be today 
if just, just the Christ followers, right, would do this. I'm not expecting others to have this kind of humility, but this is the hallmark of Jesus, and it's to be the hallmark of his followers. Humility is one of the highest values of the God's kingdom. It's, again, it's time to pick up the towel. And with the tensions that currently exist in our country, in our culture, we got to address this issue, especially for followers of Jesus. Because again, we represent his kingdom in our country, in our community. That's who we are. So in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of the hate, in the midst of the shouting and the pointing of the fingers, again, we are called to pick up a towel. We're called to serve. I'm not suggesting it's easy. Or again, that we're going to all have a come by ya session and we're all going to agree about everything. That's just not going to happen. Disagreement happens in policy and legislation and church. I mean, shoot, it even happens in sports. Not everyone is a Dallas Cowboy fan, right? I mean, it's shocking, but that's true. It's okay. It's okay as long as we're mature, as long as we're humble enough not to allow our disagreements to divide us. And the vitriol that we have now, it begs the question, can we talk? I'm not sure anymore, except that as Christ followers, we better be able to talk no matter what. We better be able to grab the towel no matter what. So let's grow in humility. Again, let's pick up the towel. Not the decorative one, but let's pick up the one that requires effort, that requires work. Christ followers, we have a profound opportunity to show our family, our community, the world around us, that we can disagree and we can still love one another. We can still talk with one another. We can separate the church from hate. And it all goes back to humility. It goes back to Jesus' commandment. Love God, love others. Don't burn a relational bridge over a view that you'll probably change in five years from now. So again, our task, our task show humility, even, maybe even especially when we disagree. The beginning of humility, it's knowing who God is. It's knowing who we are in God. You know, in John 13, Peter, he tells Jesus, hey, stop washing my feet. You're above this, Jesus. Jesus tells Peter, hey, sit down. If anyone is above grabbing a towel, it's Jesus. That's the point. He says, I've come to seek and to save and to serve those who were lost. But I want you to fast forward. Peter, he's now writing to the church. He's writing to followers of Jesus. And in chapter five of that first letter in verse five, and he says, and all of you, by the way, in the Greek, this means all of you, okay, all of us. Clothe yourself with what? Humility. Humility towards one another. Clothe is the word to tie around yourself. A servant's apron. I mean, isn't that great? Peter didn't get it in the moment, but he certainly got it later. He watches Jesus pick up a servant's towel. And now he states that our posture toward one another is that of a humble servant. He writes from his personal experience. Nothing is beneath us, and no one is beneath us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your unconditional love for us, for your willingness to let your son Jesus go all the way to the cross for us, for his humble example. And so, Lord, I'm praying desperately that we would have that same kind of posture. This week, that we would live, live with humility. God, that no one would be beneath us, no task beneath us. God, that each of us who claim to call Jesus Lord, that we would pick up a towel. And God, that we would serve the way you serve, with humility and with love. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Humility is an often misunderstood virtue. In a society that prizes greatness above goodness, power moves above kindness, and winning above all else. Humility feels like weakness. Wrong. Humility is the virtue of the strong. Strong enough to endure, to let others go first, to let them be in charge. Humble people don't have to get the best seats. The Bible calls that honoring others above yourself. And you can do that because you know who you are. You don't have anything to prove. 
The song we're about to sing puts it this way, who the sun sets free, ah, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. You can't get better than that. You can't be better than that. Knowing you're a child of God gives you the strength to be humble, to honor others. And communion, it's about the one we call the Son of God, who knew who he was so he could humble himself for our sake. The bread and the cup, he gave all he had, his body and his blood for us. That's how strong he was, strong enough to die on the cross for others. So we pray. Thank you, Lord, for not, not counting equality with God, something to be grasped for yourself with no regard for us. Thank you for humbling yourself, becoming like us, so you could redeem and empower us, so we'll have the strength to be humble. Amen.
there's room for all of us in God's house, in God's kingdom. And so we want to make sure that you know that. And if you have any questions about where your status is, uh, we would love for you to connect with our online host, our online pastor, or text me or email us. Uh, we'd love to follow up with you. If you're having some other things that are going on in your life, maybe because of the pandemic or maybe it's because of the fire still, we'd love to help you. So make sure you reach out. You don't have to do this alone. We're in all this together. So again, thanks for being here today and have a great week and we'll see you next time.